Alisa. Awesome. Hey, everybody. My name is Alyssa DiCaprio. Uh, I work for Swift as uh, head of industry engagement. Uh, and before that, I was chief economist at R3. So my remit at Swift is largely to work with central banks and to work with payment market infrastructures uh, to increase the speed of payments, increase the transparency of payments, as well as building out digital public infrastructure. Swift Network is you know, world renowned for, um, for, for moving or messaging that enables money movement. Where are you seeing the, the key drivers for the shift to crypto payments? I'm going to give you a very different answer. OK, cool. <laughs> so I think you know, from, from the perspective of cross-border wholesale payments, uh, really where we see the, the drivers of, of stablecoins coming from is, first of all, just the existence of DeFi, right? So institutions, customers, clients, all of them see that it's possible to do instant payments. It's possible to do instant settlement. Why aren't we doing it in all of the different transactions that we have? So I would say that's very directly the first the first driver. And then the second driver, honestly, is really around the G20 goals. So the G20, which is only 19 countries, you're welcome, is, is looking at, has a goal for 2027 that something like 75% of global payments are credited to the beneficiary's account in less than an hour. And so how do you do that with traditional payments? It's really challenging. Um, so it's kind of straightforward. If you're doing this with digital assets, that works very well. Mm. If you're doing it with traditional payments, it's a little bit more difficult. So you know, one of the things that, that we find, for example, is that already 90% of payments are credited to the beneficiary bank in less than an hour. But then the, the actual account of the recipient, only 43% of those flows, 43% of the 90% are going into the beneficiary's account in less than an hour. And that's for reasons of batching, which you don't need to do with stable coins. Uh, it's a reason of closed payment systems. So maybe the payment went overseas, the system was closed at the time, so it's not going to get credited in an hour. Mm. Um, and then different compliance features. Um, so there's some jurisdictions, for example, where you need to pay the beneficiary before you actually credit the account. I'm sorry, you need to call the beneficiary before you actually credit the account. That's going to take you some time. So I, these are the two main drivers that we see from a wholesale cross-border payments uh, perspective. Cool, thank you. Once we've got these drivers in place and we all kind of agree that we're, we're being kind of forced forward uh, with this new technology, you then get this kind of inhibitor, which is enterprise adoption. Yeah, so we all know enterprise change moves glacially. So how do those two things come together? What do you see in terms of the, um, the ability for enterprise to adopt this new technology? And if I direct that to you, Elisa, first, you know, because Swift has this you know, probably the most glacial of change processes for, for obvious, and, um, obvious reasons. Where are you uh, swift adapting or augmenting to uh, incorporate this, this new technology? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say there's, there's really two levels of this. So the first level is internal, and the second level is external. Um, so internally, right, we have message fields, we have things like this that need to be adjusted. So for example, if you're doing a cross-border payment, there's a drop-down currency menu. It's an ISO menu, it's not a SWIFT menu, but it doesn't have stable coins in it. Yeah. So that needs to be adjusted. Um, the size of the fields needs to be adjusted. Right now, well, we're, we're in the process of making changes like this, but the size of the field will fit a BIC number. It won't fit a wallet address. Um, so you know, th these are the kind of mechanical problems that we have to work through. So I think those are happening. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the second level at which Swift works is with our is, is with, uh, with our banks, right? So Swift is just, you know, we're the network, but really where the problems happen or where the changes happen is at the bank level. So a lot of what we're trying to do is make it easier for banks to then incorporate these new technologies and these new payment instruments. Yeah. Um, so that's a, you know, it's a combination of addressing the, the reasons for fragmentation, um, addressing the compliance issues. Compliance is hugely problematic for these banks because, of course, if you're using traditional rails, right, you have a certain way of doing compliance. If you're using stable coins, you need to collect a different kind of data set. You need to know the person's mobile number. You need to know the place of residence. You need to know the place of birth. These are things that you don't collect in a normal bank transfer. So with compliance, that's a problem. We're trying to help our different banks deal with that. So I think it's, it's really around these two levels. It's both internal, which is fairly straightforward, because you know, we're a company, you can change those things. And then it's external, which is how do you change all of the different nodes in your network and make it easier and less costly for them? 
Um, you know, as, as an example, right, there's 120 plus, somebody in this room knows this right, correct number, <laughs> uh, different wallet providers. If you're a bank, do you think you're gonna integrate with 120 different wallet providers? Of course not. That is hugely expensive. But if we can provide a way that they could integrate maybe with an aggregator or some other way, then that would make it cheaper for them and make it more straightforward for the entire industry. So this is really where we're looking. Um, we've done a lot of POCs, kind of live trials, to understand where the different pressure points are and where the frictions are and how they can be addressed. Yeah. And so, 2025, you've got a lot of live trials coming up because we, we were talking Absolutely. to your team <laughs> last week, just last week, and uh, some amazing stuff coming up. I'd like to switch uh, tack now to talk about interoperability, interoperability and standards. From my perspective, I think these are problems that need solving in order that we can really truly scale and embrace the, the potential for, uh, for uh, programmable digital money. So in turn, I think, it could each of you speak to interoperability and, and uh, standards, starting with you, Elisa. Sure, I love interoperability and standards. <laughs> what more would you like to know? <laughs> um, well, I'm, I'm well, kidding. Where do we need, okay, to, to uh, be a bit more pointy about it, what do we need to start with right now that will make the biggest change, and where's the low-hanging fruit? Okay, so I think I think that's a that's a good way to think about it. I think on you know in standards, a lot of what I was talking about earlier is is already well in motion, right? So, for example, uh, what kind of data are you collecting? Uh, what do you need? How are you doing compliance? How are regulators doing this? This is this is all in progress. I think the question of interoperability is a little bit more tricky, right? Um, because what we're seeing with stablecoins is this explosion of new types of financial instruments, which is fantastic, but it also increases complexity enormously. Yeah. And so how do you simplify that? So you make sure that there's still a stable flow, right? And you make sure that everybody can access this because right now that is definitely not the case, right? You certainly have different sectors that are using it heavily and some sectors that are not using it at all, but that should be using it. So I think in terms of, you know, we've, we've focused a lot on financial fragmentation and how to reduce that. And it's not just a story about one company doing it. It has to be a collaborative effort. You know, one of the things that we're doing is working very heavily on digital public infrastructure. And this is interesting because this is the idea that you have institutions and you have governments which traditionally have not built payment rails, right? Payment rails are often built by the private sector and sort of backed up by the public sector. Mm -hmm. And now we see the public sector saying, oh, there's all these things going on. We actually have to be involved in this. And you see this movement of national payment systems, of different regulations about AI and DLT and stable coins. And so how are all these things coming together? And so we're really working to collaborate with different institutions and different governance now on the public side to see how that can reduce some of the problems with interoperability that we have from this hugely fragmented sector. Great, thank you.